Come on, camera. There I am. Hey, tonight on the extremely late Mac to the Future live cast, we have. See, I'm I'm already screwing it up. Uh, Qu- Quasi Hankins. There you go. Nice job. Oh, thank you, thank you. Who is a longtime podcaster, and we are going to talk about what he does and his setup. And we got we got a story here how malware is dumb and other stuff. It's 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 going to be a show just like it always is. The Mac to the future. Where the hell are my opening credits? There they are. Be right back. Ugh. Hey, hey everybody, we are live on a Friday night. I know we usually do this on a Wednesday night, but it was the whole holiday thing and fireworks and my dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. It was, it was insane. So here we are. It is the Mac to the future, uh, live cast normally on a Wednesday night, but it's not. So, Hey, hooray. We have, uh, we have a special guest this week. We have Quasi. Hankins, did I say that right? Was it close? Uh, it works. Yeah, Hankins, that's fine. You, Hankins. You, you, hey, you got past the first name. <laughs> okay, well, you know, the thing is, I'm from Florida, okay? Originally, I'm from Florida, which means that uh, that I have all kinds of trouble. See, now I'm having trouble finding your Skype window. There you are. Now everyone can see you. Isn't that great? What do you think? <laughs> and now I can't, oh, and here's your lower thirds. You're going to, I don't know if you're watching this on Facebook. But you will see your lower third just went by right there. And it is, it is, it is a show. It is definitely a show. So now they see the two of us. Just the two of us. We can, okay, you know what? I'm not going to sing because when I sing, I usually save that for afterwards. Boy, I sound like I'm really manic tonight. I don't know what is wrong with me. Besides, you know, just the normal stuff. <laughs> now, uh, it, see, I'm still I'm still also trying to get used to Mimo Live, which is the the software that I've been using for the last couple of weeks, and and every single week I make like little minor changes to it because I'm like, oh wow, it does that. Let me do this instead, and then I find out afterwards that I don't remember how to get to all of the things that I just did. But that's neither here nor there. Now, <laughs> the reason why I kind of wanted to, to to bring you on now, you and I have been talking through Facebook for I, like the last year, something like yeah, that. Roughly, roughly. Mm-hmm. And uh, you are not a stranger to podcasting. I mean, you've been you've been doing podcasting for a while, about three years. Okay, so but and the weird thing, you do a lot of shows that are related to the Chicago area, right? Got a Chicago Bears podcast, correct? Okay, but you don't actually live in Chicago. No, I live in Las Vegas, but <laughs> I know it's a weird story. But I did live in Chicago for in the mid '90s, so I don't know if that gives me any bonus points. But but yeah. So you're a big the Bears fan? Oh, absolutely. I think you can tell from behind me that uh, little banner up. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. The weird thing is, my mother actually grew up in Harvard, Illinois. If you know where that uh, is, is that and- West? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. And spent uh, a lot of her father actually, or my grandfather, who I never met, was a uh, truck driver in the 30s, 1930s. And you may have heard of of there was there was some illegal activity going on in the Chicago area (laughs) in the 1930s. It had something to do with alcohol, from what I understand. (laughs) You know, this was a little thing. So. Uh, my mother used to tell me stories and she said basically that her father kind of ran illegal, illegal liquor <laughs> in Chicago nice. in the 1930s out of a bread truck, out nice. of a bread truck. But <laughs> uh, let's see, Yvonne 
I can't pronounce your last name. Yes, I had a great 4th of July. Thank you so much for asking. I'm having awful times with names tonight. So, you know, I'm just going to go with first names, Quasi. And you got it. we're just going to go right with that. So tell me about how you got started in podcasting. Oh, gosh. Uh, I was a Facebook aholic, uh, face bonker. And I was just tired of the stuff that was on there gets lost in the scrolling sea. And a family member turned me on to podcasting. I started listening to it back in summer of 2015. And I started with YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I was one of those guys that was like, you know, I'm going to do everything for free. Because I was reading stuff in the community. I'm like, I'm going to prove them wrong. And I did FeedBurner. I did YouTube. I did Blogger. And then I realized, you know what? You got to pay a little bit to really make this thing pop. Um, I spent some time doing, lot, not really live streaming, but working with a gentleman on Spreaker that had a sports podcast. Kind of gave me some practice. And then I launched uh, my little thing, the PodWabbit Network, back in January 2016. And from there, it's just been a learning curve, just really trying to improve, uh, doing live stream, really got you know, getting heavy into that uh, this past year, focusing on live stream with a lot of the podcasts that I do. So that's kind of where it started, to give you the, the short version. Well, what, what are some of the, I mean, you started with this podcast on Spreaker. What was that called? It was called Intentional Grounding. It was a sports theme podcast. And it was funny because I was, I th- caught, thought of the name in the shower. I'm a big NFL fan. I'm like, how can I okay. use that? So it was called Intentional Grounding, uh, Loss of Reality. And the idea was to kind of ground reality in the sports fan. So if you, I, I know you're a big hockey fan too. Uh, Sometimes sports fan, you know, don't what, really what, get it. <laughs> the, you know, the weird thing is growing up in South Florida, mm-hmm. other than the Dolphins, there were no sports yeah. teams. Right. You know, we had we had the Fort Lauderdale Strikers with the old North American Soccer League. That was it. You know, mm-hmm. that and the Dolphins. And uh when I when I left South Florida for Ohio, um, of course there was, you know, the, the rich history of uh sports franchises, not necessarily successful sports franchises, but sports franchises in general right. in Ohio and of course being so close to Michigan and being so close to Pennsylvania, uh, there, there was a lot of, a lot of sports activity up there. And, you know, people were like, well, you you don't watch hockey. It's like, what? who's gonna, who's gonna play hockey in (laughs) South Florida in the summertime going up and even in the wintertime, it's too hot. And, you know, lo and behold, all this time later, you, you've got the Panthers and of course you've got the, uh, the, the Marlins and the Tampa Bay. Uh, Rays for baseball, and of course, you know, two, three major football teams now in Florida. Right, uh, right. I, I guess the only cross-platform thing I can think of with Chicago and South Florida was when Jim McMahon was quarterback for the 85 Bears, and they were just running up and down, kicking everybody's ass in the NFL. Until they ran into the Miami Dolphins, who were having yeah. not, a, not a great season at <laughs> right, the time. Right, right. And uh, they go up into Chicago on a Monday night. Oh, yeah. And somehow or another, Marino pulls out a win. And that was the only blemish on the Chicago Bears uh, football season that year when they won the Super Bowl. Oh, that yeah. Was, Absolutely. You know, so I remember weird. that. So I did the intentional grounding thing. Oh, we're and, talking about podcasting. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I wanted to get into other things, but sports was kind of an easy way to break into podcasting for sure. me. Um, then I caught the bug, uh, became an addict. It was funny. I had a meetup group here in Vegas. I introduced myself and said, hi, I'm Quasi. I'm a podcast addict. And the guy that runs it at the end, he thought maybe I was there like I was an addict from recovering from drugs or alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's not that dissimilar. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I, I don't know if this is a mistake, but then I got into tons of podcasting. I did the, the Bears podcast. I got a, a tech podcast going. Uh, look, I did a little bit of nursing because my background is an ER nurse. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I also got into current events, social issues, things like that. And at one point, I think I had maybe not active, but about 10 podcasts. That, you were, that you were doing yourself. Yeah, yeah. I had I have co-hosts that I had. Uh, we created a, a spinoff of Intentional Grounding called the Sports Chop Block, where myself, longtime high school or actually junior high friend, we brought in another guy. We actually right. do this in different states. 
And it just got to be the point where like, you know what? So within the last year, I've actually downsized. I pod faded a few, you know, got rid of a couple podcasts and just really kind of, you know, narrowed it down to now five. <laughs> so, well, it's, it's the, the, the problem I think with, with doing, cause I'm doing, I'm doing this right here, the Mac to the future podcast, typically not tonight on Wednesday nights. Uh, I've got the, my Mac podcast that I do with Gaz on the weekends. And then I just started this new thing called guys daily drive that I basically just put up a, I take an iPod touch, put it underneath the mirror of my car and then just record myself as I'm driving to work or coming back from work or, or wherever. And it's, you know, and even with just those three, it seems like there's not enough hours in the day to yeah. not even so much doing the podcast. Actually doing the podcast is the easy part. That's the easy part. It's right. It's all the prep before and it's all the post-production after. And what I've found uh, with live casting, live casting, as far as editing goes, is so much more easy because you don't have to sit there and go, okay, well, at, at 14.05, Bobby said a bad word, and we have to take that bad word out. So I'm going to scrub through until I find that, and then I'm going to put the edit mark here in GarageBand, the edit mark here in GarageBand, and then mar them back up. And you, you do this over the course of a one-hour podcast. And, and that includes doing things like putting in a break for uh, an ad for another podcast or, you know, the, the putting in your, your opening stuff and your closing stuff and, and the after show stuff. And by the time you get done, you have roughly 45 minutes to an hour of an audio podcast that has taken you four hours to edit. It can take that long, but with live yeah. casting, it's like, okay, I started here. I ended here, boop, upload it to Facebook. Facebook does all the encoding. Who cares? And then it gets done. Right. So I find that it's so much, e doing live casting is so much easier and doing video is so much easier than just doing audio. And I don't know yeah. why. I agree. And, and I was frightened of live stream. I, I, when I, my, the guy that I worked with on Spreaker, he suggested I do it. I'm like, there's no way I can't do it. And now that's all I want to do to your point. I spend a little bit more time in pre-production, checking mm -hmm. the audio levels, maybe getting some bullet points. But in post, I mean, trust me, I was one of those guys that was real anal about editing because that's what the community said. You right. got to edit out the ums. You got to make it perfect. No, you but see, then I, I don't bother with that. Yeah. But see, I, it, it took me to listen to some people that have been doing it for a while. When I heard my first podcast where the guy's like, you know what, we're not going to edit this. I'm like, Oh, you, you don't have to edit a podcast. So yeah. from there on point, I mean, the only, the only show we do the sports job block, we do do some editing because we have other people come in, you know, they have their input. We want to make sure that we're speaking for the three of us outside of that. Everything else is live stream. It's so much easier. So I agree with you. Once you're done, boom, it's out and I don't yeah. mess with it. So when, when you're, after you're done recording, uh, now you're doing these other ones as live cast. So you've got your pre-roll, which mm -hmm. is, you know, your, Hey, we're the sports chop block right, guys, right. blah, 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 with theme music and all the rest of that. That's all pre-recorded. So you hit a button that rolls through, you guys do your show. Then you've got like, I'm guessing some kind of end something or another that you just hit a button and it does something. And then when you're done, you hit stop show and you're done. And then you, all you really have to do at that point is probably, well, does it, I don't know what, I guess we should talk about the software that you use. Sure. So, uh, for, do you use different software for when you're doing audio versus video? Well, it's actually combined. So, uh, when I do a live cast, it's OBS to do mm -hmm. the video. Oh, great I push software. that out. Yeah, I push it. Well, it's got what I can afford. <laughs> I'm sorry. And actually it's what I can afford because it's free. Oh yeah. Uh, but I actually tried to do, uh, what's the other one? I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. It starts with a W, I think. Anyway, the one that's real expensive. Um, oh, Wirecast. Wirecast. So I tried yeah, the ugh. trial. The problem is it, <clears throat> excuse me, it hogged my CPU down. I mean, it was like 80% yeah. CPU usage. OBS, 15 to 16%. Yeah. So OBS, yeah. Um, I also, I'm running on, on Mac platform. I've got an iMac 2013. Uh, it's, it's an i5, but it works. I, I increased the RAM. Anyway, then I'm running uh, Loopback, 
mm-hmm. and then Audio Hijack to do all my recording. So I do everything in the box. I have Ferrargo as my uh, jukebox kind of player because I used to have an iPad. So that has all my pre stuff in there and then post. And then I just fire it up, fire it off in the YouTube. And then when it's done, I take the recording from Audio Hijack. I put that in the Logic Pro. I used to use GarageBand. And then I just do all my EQ. I actually have a template save, so I don't have to do that. Yeah, that's right. And I then too. that that audio then gets uploaded for my podcast portion. So how can I ever thank you enough? Yeah, well, you can't. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's Farago. Um, yeah. A lot of people used to use Ambrosia Software's soundboard uh, until, for whatever reason, Ambrosia Software just seemed to kind of die. So you know, I don't think. Uh, you know, soundboard still works, but it's starting to get very, very creaky. It would quit so, on me a lot. Yeah, yeah. So I was very, very happy when uh, Rogue Amoeba came out with Farago. Something I really wish they would do. There was a program a number of years ago called Ubercaster. I don't know if you ever heard of this. I've heard of it. Mm-hmm. And it was from this, some company. It was like positive software for the people. I mean, it was this weird kind of weird vibe. And what this software did, I actually had a pre-release of it. Uh, you could record from it. There were uh, little buttons that you could set up to have like live uh, audio snippets. You could integrate it with Skype. I mean, it was basically, it was an all-in-one podcasting solution. And then, you know, just as, I think just as they were getting ready to release it, Apple did something with audio and it just broke everything. And I think those guys were just so downhearted or downheartened by having to almost start from scratch that they were like, you know what? The hell with it. We're, we're, we're giving up. And Ubercaster just never went anywhere after that. But I, I really wish that rogue amoeba with all the pieces they have, cause they've got, loop back that you can use to route audio from, you know, any source hardware or software to any other source. You've got, uh, uh, audio hijack, which lets you put in filters and effects. And again, you know, using the, um, the inputs and the outputs that you create in loop back, you can route that to the, to the digital audio workstation of your choice there's like just all these bits and pieces that Rogue Amoeba has that is just amazing. And I wish they could somehow kind of meld all those in to one software package to do all this stuff. Um, It'd be cool if they had like a virtual mi- uh, mixing board because I don't have a physical board. No, neither I mean, do I, I, I anymore. I have a couple audio interfaces that I, you know, run into the computer, but. I like to do everything in the box and that's what I love about their, their products. It's, yeah. you know, pretty simple. Well, we were, we were talking about that just before we started recording. We're both using, uh, probably one of the cheapest audio interfaces that are, that is currently available and we don't use it because it's cheap. I mean, sure. That's, that's a, a benefit, but the reason why we use it is that it's just a, a damn good box and it's, it's the Behringer, umc 204 hd and there's i mean you besides the 204 hd there's also the 202 hd and the 404 hd and then they've got one i think that's like eight in and eight out it's some crazy crazy number but this is an audio interface that rivals i think really anything else that's out there for just moving audio from one source to another and to be able to take some of these super gain hungry mics, I don't know what kind of mic you're using. This is a, this is a Heil PR40, which really, really needs a lot of gain. It's it's a gain, super gain hungry dynamic microphone, and the the Behringer 204 that I have handles it with ease. Yeah, I had the uh, Blue Yeti when I started, and right uh, then I upgraded to the ATR2100, and then I found this, the Shure SM27, uh, at the North. Uh, National Association of Broadcasters, NAB, that I attend annually here in Vegas. Oh, and nice. when I did so a test right drive, there. I fell in love with it. I mean, it, it, that's the one thing about mics. You have to find one that fits your voice. This is also a, uh, uh, just drawing a blank here, carotid, condenser? Uh, condenser, condenser mic, sorry. And that, it's also that, gain was hungry. That, was that what you were trying to say? Condenser? Yeah. Okay. The nursing uh, kind of came I guessed. In. I but, guessed uh, nicely. There we go. <laughs> 
but it, yeah, I run it into now. I have a unique setup. I also have a Roland VT3 voice transformer, mm-hmm. and that's I've a beautiful thing. That. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing about when you're doing live. So I can come in and do my little captain's voice and say, "Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast." <laughs> then I can switch back and forth, and I love that that it's on the fly versus post. So my mic runs into that, which has you know I can turn on the um, uh, drawing a blank here the power. And then I run it to the Behringer. So it's a little well, bit you, unique setup, but uh, it works. You know, you can do that as well in Audio Hijack. You can. I just like the buttons. And I can, you know, pitch on the fly, shift things. So if I even want to do a little deeper voice, you can. No, it's just, no, no, I understand push. completely. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's, it's fun. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, but it would, be, it would be a lot easier to do that. Uh, from an external box where you just hit a button as, cause yeah. I mean, I'm, excuse me, I'm doing this through audio hijack through their AU pitch filter mm-hmm. and it does work, but it's more screen real estate that right. you have to have. Um, it's, it's almost a shame that there isn't some way to, uh, and you know what? There probably is some way to integrate just a switch that will interact, you know, with like the, the outputs to USB. And then when you hit this button here on this switch, it does something in some other program. You could probably set up like a, um, like an automator action or something mm-hmm. along those lines to do that. Uh, that would be a lot more convenient than, than doing it on the fly. Like I just did. Yeah. They have controllers for like logic pro. X, but that'd be cool if you know Rogue Amiga could create, like you said, condense everything into one virtual box. Oh, that would be kind of slick. <laughs> so now you've got that's you said that's an RE27 condenser microphone. Who makes that? No, no, it's a Sure SM27. Sure, sure makes SM27. It. I'm very, yeah. very sorry. Yeah, that's all right. All right, so so you have that going through. You have phantom power turned on on mm-hmm. in the Baron. The roll. Actually, interface. going through the Roland. It's going through the Roland. Oh, ah, okay, okay, yeah. and then. So I guess, so you're not even using phantom power off of. I'm using phantom power on the Roland. It has but, it built but in. But not on the, not on the Behringer. Not on the Behringer because I actually, it's kind of a weird. I have uh, two cables, one going to the Behringer mm-hmm. and then one going into the H6. So as we're doing this show, I'm recording myself on through the H6, but then I've got my mic going to the Behringer to the computer. That's how you hear me. Um, okay. I switch things up a little bit depending on what I do, but all well, these how, things kind of. How in turn do you record other people? Well, that depends. So then that's when I would pull up Audio Hijack and loop back. and everything will yeah, loop back. So everything will come through that way. Correct. Okay. Because I basically have in loop back and we're, I know we're going a little inside baseball here <laughs> in loop back. <laughs> I've got a, uh, an output that's simply called um, garage band. And I don't, I mean, I have eight outputs that are associated with it but I don't have anything specific that's tied to those outputs. And then I use those outputs in audio hijack and specify which one of them that I want the various different pieces to go to. So like when I'm recording the my Mac podcast, I take the, the first two outputs outputs one and two on GarageBand out in loopback. And those go to uh, the first track in GarageBand, which is channels one and two. And then I got channels three and four and five and six, three and four is Skype. Five and six is uh, good old Virago. Yay. <laughs> and uh, that allows me to route everything that I'm doing into GarageBand on separate tracks. That's, and that's one of the things that and I, just, I know this is starting to sound like a freaking rogue amoeba commercial. Um, <laughs> other than uh, what is the name of that program? Soundflower which over the course of time it became very, very buggy. Uh, Loopback kind of, didn't kind of, definitely took its place. And it does everything that Loopback does and more because you can't assign uh, software outputs into Soundflower like you can with Loopback. I actually have a couple of videos in YouTube showing how I integrate Audio Hijack, Loopback, and GarageBand to record the podcast. 
and they were very helpful, I must admit. You, oh, did you helpful. watch those? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, okay. I know somebody actually came on and one of them said, oh, you sound, your voice sounds too wet or yeah, I wasn't loud enough or <laughs> something YouTube, like that. YouTube, like whatever, I come know, on. You know? I know. But no, he, I mean, they weren't wrong. But the th I always thought it was kind of ironic that I, I've made these YouTube videos to explain how I painstakingly craft audio, but then the audio in the YouTube video sucks. So, you know, what, what are you going to do? Can't please right. everybody. So you've got, you've got the Shure SM27. That's going yep. to a rolling unit that lets you do. I really, really like that airplane, that airplane voice. <laughs> that was, that was super cool. See, I uh, use this for one of my hockey podcasts, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Welcome aboard. <laughs> And the um, so and then you have the output of the Roland going to. Well, does the Roland have a USB out or is it does? So you can power it by by basically plug into the wall or uh -huh. USB. So I have it going into the wall to avoid the computer, and then I basically just have two lines out. So I got one mono going into the Behringer, one mono going into the Zoom H6. Well, couldn't you couldn't you use the the Roland to go directly to the computer? Or, or I could, I could. The problem with that though is I then run into that hiss issue because uh, the, okay. the Behringer, because those 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 Midas preamps, which are I get awesome. I get nothing. If I plug that H6 or the Roland into the computer, you get that that hiss sound that yeah. you know it's kind of a pain. So that's the reason why I, I set it up that way. Trust me. This thing took me months and months to to play around with, and I finally got it right. So the other thing I do real quick is when I do, I also uh, live cast in a Spreaker. So mm -hmm. I bought a external. Uh, a, uh, a actually, before, before you say that, let me ask sure. you something about Spreaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have I have looked at that as a service, mm -hmm. and I have looked at their desktop software, which honestly is really good software. Yeah. Yeah. Why they don't sell that? That is real, real close to an all-in-one solution because yeah, I agree. You do have now. If I was going to criticize the Spreaker software, it would be that their chat feature only works with Spreaker. You can't make it work with right. YouTube or Facebook or something right, right. along those lines. If it did those things, that might be the only thing I use. Uh, and if they had video, that would be sweet. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's asking much. <laughs> and well, and the only other thing I can think of is the output of Spreaker is two channel. You can't do multi channel out. You can do multi channel in. You can have right, up to right, four right. inputs right. using the Spreaker software. And anyone who's, who does podcasting, go to Spreaker.com, make an account, download the Spreaker software for podcasting. It's really, really good software. And if you're using something like Audacity, which I have to say, I don't understand the fascination and why so many people love using Audacity. I have tried to use it. It is, it has the worst user interface of nearly any DAW. And it's not even really a DAW because you can only do two, two tracks with it, I think. Yeah. That I've seen anywhere. I, I, I don't understand why people like it so much other than the I, fact I, that it's free. That's it. I think that's the key, especially if you're getting started. You know, I was there too. You know, you realize, you know, try and look for free. Then once you start doing it yeah, and, and you start listening to other people in the community, then you realize, oh, there's some other options. So lots of other options. Yeah. I mean, I started with GarageBand. I mean, it was free. It came on the iMac. I still use it. And I, I switched over to Logic Pro X just because I saw a demo and I just, and it, it really, to be honest with you, I had too many steps I was going through with GarageBand uh -huh. in conjunction with other things. I think I counted out, I had like 12 steps. I'm now down to five. So I have nothing against GarageBand. I, I like it, but I'm really happy with Logic Pro X. Are, are you a writer as well? No, I suck at writing. That's why I got into podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> I have the worst grammar, the worst spelling. That's why I got into the, another reason I got into this. So no, not because <laughs> I would I would love to see like a, a a breakdown of what you were doing in GarageBand versus what you're doing in Logic. I've got it saved somewhere. Matter of fact, um, when we're done, I'll send it to you because in one of the community groups, uh, in the podcasters editor club, we we talked about that. So I'll have to find it and I'll I'll shoot you an email. But uh, yeah, it makes a huge difference. So, but you know that's the cool thing about podcasting. There, there's 
There's no, something, there's no one right way. Exactly. Exactly. Though, even though, of course, the stuff that we do, that is the right way. Everybody else is wrong. <laughs> That's, yeah, well, it's got to be on a Mac. Absolutely. Man. Yes. If you're if you're not on a Mac, then, you know, hey, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> and if you're on a Linux, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> See, now all the, I, I, I would say all the people that, that use Linux are now going to write and, you know, hate me and well, all the rest of You realize what you're based None on. None of them are listening. None of them are listening. So <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah, I know. Well, OS X, or sorry, Mac OS, uh, isn't so much based in Linux as it is in Unix. Um, but of course, Linux also has its route, its routes, its roots right. in uh, Unix as well. And We're all okay. twisted cousins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's all better than Windows. Okay, so <laughs> all okay. <that> matters. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is all that matters. Um, so, so I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Let's let's talk about Spreaker. Yeah. So basically, why I mentioned Spreaker is I bought a MacBook uh, Pro uh, early 2011. The reason I did that is, one, I wanted to be able to go portable, but just in case the iMac died on me, which I doubt will happen, I've only owned three Macs in my life, That's it's a backup. But anyway, so I run the Spreaker desktop that you spoke of on the MacBook Pro, so then I use my H6 as a audio interface. I switch it up, and then I can run all my audio from my Mac into the MacBook. Because remember, I've got an older iMac. It's, a, it's an i5. And I don't want to run everything on there. So it works great. So I use Spreaker on that. The only reason I do that, just to kind of get your voice heard in different platforms. That's that's really it. And, and I used it before in the past and, and really like what they, they do. And it's affordable. So Well, have you have you gotten, like when you've done your, have, you, you did live shows on Spreaker, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I do them right now, too. Yep. Do you get any any comments or feedback as yeah, you're doing yeah. the show? Yeah. Um, actually, um, it's funny. Uh, I, I saw you do like some little iTunes music after your, your show yeah. that you do on Facebook. Yeah. And I put that on Spreaker, and that's the one platform that I don't get dinged. Now, see, I've run into getting shut down by Facebook and YouTube, yeah. you know, for I whatever. But on Spreaker, but I don't save any of this stuff. I delete all that. But when I did that, there was some comment. Um, there's another show that I do that I just started a couple months ago. There's a lot of comments after the show. And then I'm getting a lot more followers. So the engagement with Spreaker to me seems better than YouTube. I mean, I, I, I don't do Facebook Live because one, to me, Facebook is just kind of narrow and limited for what I do. And you don't really, can't really reach an audience. With Spreaker, there's a lot more discovery that I'm finding. So that's the, the main reason I'm doing it. I should probably look into that because uh, one of the reasons why I do this the way I do it now I do a um when I when I do this live cast on Facebook, not only do I have it on my own personal page, and I have it on my personal page so that it reaches a wider audience, but then I also share that over to the Mac to the Future group because that's well that's you know how this whole thing started. Um but I have been trying to figure out a way to to expand the audience. And at first I was thinking maybe YouTube, but then, you know, the, the problem with YouTube or even something like Twitch is these are, these are both platforms that are just so huge that you get lost in the noise. Yeah. And I'm having second thoughts about YouTube, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm not really getting a lot of the views that I'm on Spreaker. Not that I'm getting ton. Right. But I'm, I'm, I'm considering maybe playing, because the other thing too I liked about Wirecast is I could simulcast to both Facebook and YouTube, but it just ate up my CPU. Yeah. So with OBS, I'm kind of stuck. I, I have to pick one or the other. So I may play around with it and try Facebook. But again, it, unless you have a wide current list of friends on your you know, list, so to speak, you're, you're, it just seems narrow. I don't really have discovery on Facebook. And to me, Facebook... I don't know. I'm just, that's another conversation. <laughs> well, have you heard of Ecamm Live, that software? I have. Um, I know a lot of people use it to record, uh, especially their Skype, things of that sort, but that's about as familiar I am with it. Uh, well, no, Ecamm Live is kind of like OBS, kind of like oh, okay. Mimo Live, where it does video. Okay. And uh, prior to me getting this, this free copy of Mimo Live, thank you, Boink Software. Um, I'm still evaluating, still evaluating. Um, that's, that's the software I was using. And the great thing, you know, I have used, I used Wirecast. I had a previous version of Wirecast and no sooner had I finished paying for it 
they came out with a new version and it was like, Oh my God. So another $600 plus for this, it's like, no, it, it, uh, unless, unless you're a professional podcaster and you're getting a lot of money on the side from sponsorships or things along those lines, spending that kind of money for live casting software just doesn't make any sense to me when something like uh ecamm live uh, which is like 30 bucks i think uh mimo live which uh, honestly if if i was going to compare the user interface of wirecast and mimo live mimo live just has it beat hands down the it's you know the the thing about live cast isn't so much when you're using it because when you're using it i'm sorry wirecast when you're using wirecast other than some oddities in layering it works very very well but it is very cpu extensive with mimo live you pretty much know where everything is because you start from a layer stack at the very top which means anything that's there like right now I have like this little American flag that's in the lower right hand corner and that's at the very, very top. So if I turn that off, it goes away. I bring it back. There it is. If I put on anything live that's underneath a particular layer, you won't see it. So that's one of the things that you just have to keep, keep track of as you're doing this. And Ecamm live does the same thing. OBS does the same thing. You know, you have all these layers that you're working from. And as you set up your scenes in OBS, you have to be very cognizant of where you're putting stuff in that layer so that you make sure that it shows up uh, in your video stream. The uh, Ecamm Live works kind of that same way. I wish that the interface was a little bit different because your shortcuts are somewhat limited, but at the same time, it's 30 bucks and you're done. So, um, if can you push that both out to YouTube and, and multiple platforms or just, no, it, right now it only works for Facebook. Okay. But I what know about? that in a future version that, uh, they're going to go to YouTube, they're going to go to Twitch and they're going to go to some of the other ones, but I don't think you'll be able to, um, do them, you know, multiples at the same time. What about BMO Live? Just one platform too? Um, you know, I I haven't tried that. As I'm looking at the interface here on the side, it looks like because there is a. I'm almost afraid to hit anything as we're doing this. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, why don't we why don't we talk about that after we get done? Because otherwise, it it could be very right, right. very bad. Go, go. Yeah. And Marcus, the comments, as far as I can tell, are showing up. Uh, that's one thing that uh, the Ecamm Live software does. There's like a separate little box that the uh, Facebook comments just kind of appear in. So it's much easier to keep track of comments in Ecamm Live than it is in Mimo Live or in Wirecast. Wirecast, I could never figure out how to see com Facebook comments. And then there was another program that I used for a while. It was written by, oh God, I think the guy was, he was either Ukrainian or Russian. And it was, it was pretty decent software. And he was very responsive, but sometimes stuff would just break in it. And it handled audio in such a way that it was very, very difficult to keep track of, of what it is that was going on. Like right now, I can hear you and I can hear stuff that's going on in Farago or in iTunes or what have you, but I don't hear myself. I set my levels for myself before I start to record and then I, I turn it off so that I can't hear myself because inevitably anytime you're talking about pushing out live audio and video, you know, not even counting the 10 second lag that you get from Facebook, uh, but you're going to get some latency. And it, there's going to be that X number of millisecond delays that make it very, very difficult. And you end up sounding drunk, literally. That's, that's how I, have you, have you, have you run oh, yeah. into this? Oh yeah. 
where your voice comes into your ear like a quarter of a second after you say something and you start to kind of talk like this because your your brain isn't able to process the fact that your voice is coming back to you with that slight delay. Now, I know uh, talking to some, some friends that I knew that used to be uh, like FM radio DJs, they said they actually took classes in college that helped them to deal with latency issues. But other than that, there was, there was, you know, I, I can't afford to take a class in latency. So I just turn off my own, my own mic. So I can't hear it. <laughs> All right. So I need to look at, it sounds like I need to look at is something actually we may have a problem here. Let me see if it's looking like, I don't know if we're still transmitting live. Everything looks like it's still going. Everything looks like it's, you know, I'm just going to go on the assumption that we're still transmitting. Did something bad happen? Something bad may have happened. I don't know. Uh -oh. But it's still recording, so at the very end of the conversation, I can take this entire file and dump it into YouTube and then just send a link over later. That's the beauty of live. You just go with it. You just keep going because sometimes you don't have any choice. Um, actually, why don't we take a very, very quick little break? And when we come back, uh, we're going to talk just a couple of things that we, I've got online here to talk about. And then we'll wrap it up. You know, we've already been talking for like 40 minutes. Can you believe that? Been fun. Been fun. All right. So everyone, as soon as I can find out where the, I know they, I found them. I found them. I found the ads. There they are. We'll be right back. Are you a new Mac user or an old hand? Wish you could know the ins and outs, keyboard shortcuts, or hidden tips and tricks to make you more efficient using your favorite computer? Hey, it's your lucky day, because Edward Eisen has written a great guide to knowing more about the Mac and the OS that it runs on. It's called This Is The Light Side, and it's available through Apple's iBookstore or with Amazon. Better yet, it's not a stuffy old book that gathers dust on the shelf once the next operating system is released, because it's an ebook that you can look at any time you want. It won't get outdated because it's continuously being updated. Information on setting up your new Mac, installing and getting rid of applications, security settings and what to look out for, keyboard shortcuts, some basic app recommendations, how to use Windows on your Mac, if you really want to, that is. Advanced topics, searching, using iCloud, and much more. All this for a mere 99 cents. Go to the iBookstore or Amazon and check out Edward Eisen's This is the Light Side. It's the book you want on your virtual shelf. Okay, we are back. Um, just got one really main, one main story to talk about tonight. There was uh, some new malware that's out. Uh, it's called OSX Dummy. <laughs> uh, security researchers have spotted a new Mac malware family that's currently being advertised on cryptocurrency focused Slack and Discord channels. The malware's existence came to light last week when it was discovered by Remco Verhoff, who says he spotted crooks poison, po pose, ba, 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 posing as admins, mods, or other key figures in the cryptocurrency world, posting messages that urged users to type a long command inside their Mac terminal, because how could that not end well, uh, claiming to help with various problems. The command downloaded a hefty 34 megabyte binary named script as malware that creates a backdoor on infected systems that attempts to remain persistent. The purpose of this reverse shell is to give an attacker access to infected hosts. We don't know exactly what the, the hacker behind the malware may intend to do with access to the infected machines, but given the fact that cryptocurrency mining communities were targeted, it's a fair bet that they were interested in theft of cryptocurrency, says a Malwarebytes 
Mac malware expert. Uh, another Mac malware expert who looked at the malware named it OSX Dummy. He named it because the malware asks for the user's root password. Again, how could that could then? Well, when the user runs the code shared on Slack or Discord channels, Ex experts, experts, experts warns that this is a dangerous operation <laughs> and that uh, victim's Mac OS root password is saved in clear text and is not encrypted. And even if users remove the OSX dummy malware, this file may persist if the user doesn't clean the infection properly. As explained in a Malware Bytes blog post, if users are so careless and so unaware of the dangers of running code they copied from an online forum, they most likely have no clue about security best practices to begin with. Wow. So, here we have here we have some malware that uh that people that you don't know in cryptocurrency mining operations is saying, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just run this, run this, uh, this right, type this sentence out in your terminal and then go ahead and, and put in your, your root password because it's going to make all your problems go away. Chances are it's just going to make all of your cryptocurrency go away. <sighs> you know, when I see stuff like this, And I think about the hell that people on Windows went through in like the nineties and the aughts. It I, I just feel so sorry for them. You know, it's like this was like every day. And it wasn't even, you know, back then you could get infected just by going to the wrong website. And there wouldn't be anything you had to do in on on the Windows system. You would just be infected. And any other computer that you touched would also be infected unless they had some kind of protection against it. And it's stories like this that as soon as they come out, you see all the trolls coming. Oh, well, Macs don't get viruses, blah, 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 blah. It's like, you know, I don't care if you have all the resources of Apple and all the resources of Microsoft and all the resources of any other tech company that you care to name, you can't protect against sheer stupidity of your users. And this is a case of just sheer stupidity. If you got caught doing this because of this, please stop using computers this is like the the worst kind of of malware self-enclosed crap that i can think of just don't use computers anymore what do you, you think remi it reminds me you remember the movie airplane yes and there was one when i read this story my first thought was was that count counterpoint section and I put a little spin on it. It's like they downloaded their script. They knew what they were getting into. I say, let them get infected. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> and, without uh, using the word that he actually. Right. Right. Used but in yeah, the <laughs> it, it's just amazing that the fact that your terminal, I mean, that's a place that even I don't go and mess with unless no. there is a legit reason to, which is very few and far between. And, and, and when you're just, being told to do this, I mean, dump dummy. I mean, I, he put like six bullet points of why he's calling it. it, it they should say the user. I mean, it, it just drives me nuts. I have, I'm not going to mention who, but there are people that I know that just click on emails and things that you have no business links, messing links with. To emails. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. I almost got caught today. I, I saw someone post on Facebook about Ray Ban uh, one day sale, and I almost shared, I'm like, wait a minute, let me do some research. And you don't do it. So even even myself, you have to be careful. But when I read this, it was like, you got the terminal. You don't go there. <laughs> yeah. You know, unless you really, really know what you're doing, and I am not one of those people, leave the terminal to people that know what they're doing. Yeah, just don't. I, I, I unless, the, the last time I actually went into the terminal, 
there was a piece of software. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it called Levelator. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. And it stopped working. This was some time ago. It stopped working with one of the updates to OS 10. And you actually had to go into the Terminator to make some kind of, of little change. Now they fixed it afterwards, but in order to get it working, then you actually had to go into the terminal and do something and it got it to work. But other than that, unless I have clear instructions from websites that I trust, uh, like for example, the uh, Mac observer, you know, places like that, that have people that really know what they're talking about and not just some, guy wearing a St. Augustine, Florida hat that does a live cast. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, yeah, don't just don't do that. Leave, leave terminal alone. Um, and I guess you could almost call the second part of this show, the stupid show, because the second thing I wanted to talk about really quickly here kind of falls along the same lines. And that's that running betas can be hazardous to your max health and your data. Um, now, while I shouldn't have to say it, the fact that I see so many in the Mac to the Future Facebook group asking about public betas, uh, I find it somewhat alarming based also on the number of requests that I see for help. The one thing to remember about public betas is directly in the name itself. This is beta software, meaning it's not yet ready for prime time, and there could be serious bugs and flaws inherent in the software that could potentially damage the data that you have or lead to odd behavior that you might not expect. Don't run Apple betas on your main phone, iPad, or computer unless you truly don't care about the consequences and don't expect anything but derision if you complain after the fact. Having said that, the second beta is now out for Mac OS Mojave. <laughs> so rush out and get it now. There you go. Yeah. Have, do you run any uh, betas on your stuff? It will never touch the computer, period. I mean, this is my, <laughs> I know I don't get paid for what I do, but this is my livelihood. So it will right. never see it. Matter of fact, I even wait a little bit once it's become alpha. The main one. Just yeah. to make sure, yeah. Um, now, the phone, because I have a backup phone, mm -hmm. this is the first time I tried it. Um, I won't do it again, not because I've had issues. I mean, yeah, it's a little little things here and there. I'll just wait. I mean, it was just more just to try it out, but I'll never do it again you know, down the road. So, yeah, well, don't put you it on your computer. You've got, you've got a 2013 iMac. Yes. Uh, what phone are you, rock are you rocking? Uh, the 6 Plus because it's paid for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used, I had a six plus up until a couple of months ago. And the only reason why, cause I, I loved it. I, I had a, uh, it was a gold 64 gig, I think mm -hmm. gold 64 gig, the six plus. And the only reason why I gave it up is that basically it just stopped working. And, yeah. and I took it into Apple, took it into an Apple store on Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, wasn't that fun. And, you know, they looked at it and they came back and they're like, yeah, this is, this is kind of hosed. Yeah. And it was like, damn it. Okay. So I went ahead and I got a, uh, an eight plus. I didn't get, I didn't go to the, the 10, uh, mm -hmm. I, I mostly because I, you know, there was a lot about the 10. Yeah. It's got the better camera and it's slightly faster and, and all the rest of that. Number one, it was also like $200 more than the eight. And I like the home button and I'm kind of sorry that Apple seems to be going away from it. You know, the, the home button with the, the, I can't even think of what it is. The using your thumb to, to the thumb, the touch ID. Thumb, yeah. Touch ID. I thought touch ID worked brilliantly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, once they got a couple of versions of iOS into it, uh, I, I thought touch ID was great. And the whole thing with face ID is like, so I want to just sit there and hold my camera up to my face. <laughs> well, I want to answer that. Okay. Now I can do it. You know, it, it was just like, I can pick it up, hold it in my hand for a second and then it just works. And the same thing when I'm at a store, if I'm buying something with Apple pay, it's like, okay, I put the phone up there. Okay. It's going to let me buy it now. <laughs> so, that's uh, that's I get, you know, yeah. But again, don't use don't use betas on your your main stuff, and 
yeah, mostly because if you do, stuff will break eventually. I wonder if there's a correlation between those that did OX, OS 10 dummy and beta. <laughs> uh, there probably <laughs> is. I, that wouldn't surprise me in the least. Uh, real, real quick, uh, I'm going to give a little shout out here to MacStock, which is coming up in less than two weeks. This is close to your old hometown. Uh, it's in Woodstock, Illinois. The Mac Stock Conference and Expo, it's in its fourth year. It's going to be on July 21st and 22nd uh, at the L-U-E Luch Conference Center, which is located in Building B of the main McHenry County College campus in Crystal Lake, Illinois. The cost of the entire conference for both days, grand total of $179 using the coupon code MYMAC, all one word, M-Y-M-A-C. You can also use tech fan and there's a whole bunch of them out there that will bring it down to $179. There is nothing else that you have to spend to attend this conference. Of course, transportation costs are on you. Hotels are on you. <laughs> Food outside of the venue is on you, but everything related to the conference, including your lunches for both days and whatever Barry has planned for the, uh, the Midwest Mac something or other on Saturday night. I'm not quite sure what he's calling it this year. Tim Robertson and I will be doing the My Mac Game Show quiz. We got some special twists going on this year where we're going to actually going to have, uh, let's see, Bob, Dr. Mac, Bob Levitis, the CEO of uh, Mac Sales, uh, Other World Computing is going to be up there, and Barry Falk is going to be up there, and they are going to answer. We're going to put the questions to them they're going to answer them, and then the contestant has to figure out who's telling the truth. You know, it's almost like it's almost like a game show from the past, but I can't remember the name of that show. <laughs> hmm. I guess we'll just have to figure out which one is telling the truth. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's coming up July 21st and 22nd. It's going to be a blast. If you need to get there from outside the Chicago area. There's only about 600,000 different ways to get to Chicago between Midway airport and O'Hare. So, and buses and trains and everything else that goes, all roads lead to Chicago. Really? It, that's, that's pretty much the way it works. You, if you have to get somewhere and it doesn't matter if you're going from Nairobi, Kenya to Dakar, Senegal, you have to go through Chicago. That's how it works. It is. So that's going to about do it for tonight's show. Uh, Quasi, I really appreciate the fact that, that you came on, and I'm sorry I rambled so much. I have a tendency to do that sometimes. I get a little excited. Hey, this was an honor. Fun. This was an honor. Thank you so much. I had, <laughs> oh, I had very, fun. Very I, I, I enjoy it. It was fun. And uh, we'll, we'll have to get you on sometime if you want. Uh, you need somebody to come on one of your shows sometime. Just give me a call. I'm I'm usually around at night. Uh, you're you're actually two hours behind me, right? Uh, I'm Are on you Pacific on? time. Okay, so if you're three Eastern, hours. three hours. Yeah. Three hours. So uh, yeah, anytime you need somebody else to come on to give an opinion that may or may not lack any focus or sanity, I'm your guy. Cool. That's I'll look you up. Now, how can people? And I'm actually going to show it. How can people get a hold of you? The social media at the crazy wabbit. That's crazy with a K. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and then email kh at podwabbit dot com. Just like it sounds. Yep. So I actually have that on screen right now. I figured out how to do that. Damn, I'm smart. I am. <laughs> I am a. Uh, oh, I can't say it. I can't say that word. That that would be very very bad. Um, if you'd like to get a hold of me, oh, you can reach me guy at mttfgo.com. I'm also Mac Parrot on the Twitters. If you'd like to support some of the crazy stuff that I do, easiest way to do that is either through uh, a coffee page, ko-fi.com. I am Mac Parrot there. Or on the patreons.com. I am also, oddly enough, Mac Parrot on there as well. So it, basically you go anywhere and you type in Mac Parrot. There I am. So that, I think, is going to do it for the evening. And uh, I'd like to say thank you one more time to Crazy for coming on. And we shall catch you all next time, next Wednesday, hopefully. And actually, actually, before we go, before, I know, I was just like, let me interrupt myself 
one more time. Before we go, next week, which is going to be the 13th, I believe. No. Next Wednesday will be the 10th. Yeah. That will be the last show that I do here on Facebook before I go to uh, uh, to MacStock. So the 18th, which I believe is that following Wednesday, Wednesday and maybe the 25th, there may not be a Mac to the Future live cast. But however, depending on uh, bandwidth and what kind of internet con connectivity I have uh, while I'm in the Chicago area at whatever hotel or maybe even at Mac Conference and Expo, I'll try to do something live there. So uh, catch us next week, and, and I, Warren and I hopefully will be back, and we will go more into the crazy stuff that's going on here in the Mac blogosphere. We'll catch you next time on the Mac to the Future show. Bye.